Welcome back, everyone. This is, of course, Question Field, the place where you ask the questions and we field them. I am Brian, and I am joined, as always, by... Campbell. Campbell. Welcome, Cam- Campbell. How are you doing? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing too badly, thanks, Brian. Um, it's, uh, so I'm, I'm here in the UK at the moment, and it's um, uh, been nice and warm recently, so you know, it makes a change from usual UK weather, I think. <laughs> There you go, yeah. Campbell, recently I saw that uh, Newton's tree fell down, or it was uprooted, and... Uh, so I heard, yeah. So what did you do? What, did, what, what well, were you doing? Well, I, I went into a prolonged period of mourning, of course. Um, I wore all black for a week. Uh, I, I couldn't speak to anyone. I could barely eat, you know. Um, no, no I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have not really followed the news story very closely, but... Um, Oh, well, <laughs> hopefully they've managed to prop it up again <laughs> or maybe replant it. But I also I hear that there are about like five different trees or so that claim to be Newton's apple tree. Yeah, um, apparently they've been cloning the tree. Um, ah. So it's a little anticlimactic. I mean, the, it's like the ultimate version of clickbait. They say that the famed <laughs> tree has fallen over and then you learn it's not the tree. It's like, okay, well, yeah. boo-hoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Campbell, today we're talking about something uh, that I've thought about for a long time. And, you know, with f- physics is great. And like as a high school physics teacher, you know, you always try to relate what we're, you know, what we're talking about in class to the real world. Just recently, we were talking about momentum and impulse and went into, you know, why do we wear uh, seatbelts? Why do our cars have airbags? Mm. And it's because as you increase the the time of your crash, you know, it's this unintuitive thing, but you mm-hmm. increase the time, you're going to decrease the amount of force that you're that you're feeling uh, and not get mm-hmm. injured, right? And it's a real relatable, real-world situation. And uh, similar vein today, because I've always wanted to conquer the solar system. And uh, as a ruler... That's a very reasonable yeah, thing to yeah, want. You yeah, know, as, from a young age. Um <laughs> I, I, you know, my greatest weapon will be fear, of course, as it is for any tyrant. But my second greatest weapon, though, I'm thinking of like building a sphere the size of a small moon mm-hmm. and uh, putting a big laser in it. And I wanted uh-huh. to get your thoughts because I don't, I mean, I know what lasers are. I don't know how uh-huh. they work. Or maybe I really don't know what they okay, are. Cool. I, so, <laughs> so that's our question for today. I, I want to. I, I want to pitch you my idea of what I think a laser is and see if it okay. is anywhere close to the mark. And see if we can build a Death Star. And has, has that been done before? Somebody's had that uh, idea? I, I think someone's uh, maybe maybe even made a bit of money off that idea okay. Some, okay. somewhere in the past. Great minds, then. Great minds. <laughs> I, I would love to meet this person. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're talking about lasers today. Well, yeah. I mean, may, maybe you can uh, start by telling me how what you sort of think about how lasers work and uh, and the, maybe the principles behind them. Right. So let's start with the fact that laser is, uh, it's an acronym, correct? Let me see. Yeah. Let me see if I got this. Uh, <laughs> I didn't look this up uh, uh, beforehand. Light. Uh, yes. Amplified or amplification or something i think yeah oh, yeah, okay. yeah yeah okay so far this is like wordle only only worse um <laughs> that's right yeah uh let's skip s um <laughs> e uh emitted perhaps yeah i mean really? emission emission, emission okay. so yeah, pretty pretty close r ray or radiation or yeah, amazing. Oh. Did, did you actually not look this no, up? No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, wow, this is incredible, Brian. Uh, um, I mean, I had to know it for a class in college, which was many... It was a bonus question on an, on, uh, on an exam. Um, <laughs> okay, right, right. So you're tapping into the deep recesses yes, of your mind yes, here. Yes, <laughs> the mind palace. Um, the okay, S. cool. So, and then, then the S, uh, it sort of goes with emission. It's like a type of emission. If that uh, rings any bells, <laughs> super emission, <laughs> super emission. Yeah, that's a, a new type of laser that's <laughs> certainly been theorized. Listen, uh, no, it's it's stimulated emission. Stimulate, yeah, okay. I was never going to get that, so thank you. No, no fair enough. <laughs> so light amplification, stimulated emission ray. 
radiation. radiation. Yeah, and I think there are some some prepar- prepositions or something in there always, as well always, <laughs> to make yes. it make sense. <laughs> Um, yeah, so light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, I think. Okay, okay. So, yeah, and, that, and that's, the, that's the tagline of what lasers are. That's mm. the sort of operating principle of how they work Yeah. Okay. Um, in the name. So, that's a lot to break down. Mm-hmm. All right, so here's how I think lasers work. I've written out a few points here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know this is probably wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, so, here, here's my, my basic situation of how, like, if you want to DIY a laser. Mm-hmm. You take a light bulb and you hook it up to some kind of power source. You, you plug it in a wall. You have a battery, whatever. All right. Uh, you put the light bulb inside of a perfectly enclosed box. And the box on the inside, all the walls are mirrors. All right. And then at that point, you turn on your light. And so all the, the light is bouncing around all over the place, just filling up your box with more and more light. So, where does the actual laser come from? So, what you would do is you would cut uh, a small and particular hole somewhere in the box in the direction you want to uh, you want to point, um, you know, such as at a planet, uh, and <laughs> you do it in such a way that this hole filters only a certain maybe wavelength or frequency. Because I know we can get lasers in different colors. And then after that, once you have the you you have your filtered light coming out of uh, your your uh, out of the hole, that's when you you profit and you exert fear and dominance over your new under underlings. Um, how so that that's it, right? That's how you do it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So so I think there are some uh, some right thoughts there, and there are some uh, some mistakes there. Okay. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I mean, th- this is the, the, the right sort of place to start. Okay. Okay, so I guess we could maybe think through that, uh, that contraption that you made a little more fully and, like, see how it would differ from the operation of a laser. That was very kind of you to call it a contraption. That was <laughs> much more, even, it's, even it, more sophisticated than I would have <laughs> given it. I would, yeah, it's, it's a sort of projector, yes. you know. It's, um, I think it's useful for something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I guess the one thing would be, for, uh, t- for example, so, you, so in your first pass design for a laser, you have some filter, so you're only getting one color of light out at the, uh, at the business end. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's good. That's, that's what we want for a laser. However, it's not all going in the one direction. You cut it, if you cut a hole in, in, your, in your box, intuitively what you would imagine is going to happen is it's that the light is out. going to... Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's going to spread out. Um, so that's not what we we really want for a laser. We want that beam to be really focused. Mm-hmm. Um, you might say, well, okay, what happens if you just put a lens in front of that hole um, and we can focus the beam back down again? Mm-hmm. Well, that's sort of getting closer. But it turns out even then you can't get the intensity of beam that that you can with a laser. Right. So in fact, with that uh, w- with that contraption that you that you came up with, this the the first draft of yes, a laser. Yes. You could focus that beam down to heat something up, right? Mm-hmm. You could use that light energy and transfer it into an object and cause it to to heat up. But there's a maximum temperature that that object can reach, mm-hmm. and it happens to be the the same temperature um, of the light bulb inside right, the box. Right. So basically, if it ended up getting hotter than that, you would have a situation where heat was being transferred from the light bulb at a colder temperature to an object at a hotter temperature. Right. You'd be getting this situation where you, where heat was going from a cold object to a hot object. And if you know anything about thermodynamics, you might know that that violates the second law of thermodynamics. That's a, Damn, that's a big no-no. Damn, I was so close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it would not uh, help too much if you wanted to blow up a planet, for example. But uh, a laser doesn't really work like that mm. because a laser is a fundamentally what we call a non-equilibrium system. So... Yeah, if you were to try and assign a temperature to the medium inside a laser, it, in some sort of respect, you could say that it has like a negative absolute temperature. It sort of doesn't really make sense right, to, right. to assign a temperature to this thing. So, it, you can focus a laser beam down and, in principle, make something as, as hot as you want right. without violating thermodynamics. So, okay, very different, uh, very different in that respect as well to uh, a light bulb in a box. Also different in the intensity of light that you produce. So there's this this number that characterizes the sort of amount of energy that's in 
for example, like each frequency uh, of light. So if you, for example, in in your system, you have this filter, um, light is passing through that filter and maybe it's selecting out one wavelength or uh, or a sort of very narrow range of, of wavelengths. Maybe it's a bit unrealistic to think it's, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's only producing one. So then you could ask, well, what's the density of energy in those wavelengths? So the amount of energy it's putting out per second uh, divided by the, the width of wavelength mm-hmm. that is produced, if that makes sense. Uh, w- when, when the light passes through the filter, there's a sort of minimum wavelength that passes through and a maximum wavelength that passes through. And that bandwidth uh, is like the, um, yeah. It's, it's, it's just like going to have like an associated energy with that specific wavelength. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So it's like, so what we're interested in is the energy output of this box uh, per frequency bin, if you like, per mm-hmm. frequency um, slot. And for sunlight, this uh, this spectral, this is called a spectral brightness. Um at a, at a given frequency um, or wavelength of light. Mm-hmm. And, for example, in sunlight, you know, the the sun pro- uh, produces an enormous amount of energy, right? But in comparison to a laser, the so-called spectral brightness is very, very dim. It's very, very low. Um, so, what that means is that the energy output of the sun is spread into a whole bunch of different different frequencies. Okay. Whereas for a laser... There's a, a large amount of energy that's deposited into a very narrow band. Okay. Exactly, a very narrow band of wavelengths. So this is why we're not just getting constantly Death Star bombarded by the sun. It's because all that energy. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess also because a very small fraction of the energy from the sun actually reaches the Earth. So if you were to just have a regular light bulb and then filter out light of a certain wavelength, you would have an incredibly dim light in comparison to lasers. So that's another key difference. So I'm I'm wasting it. My light bulb is so wasteful. I need a green <laughs> Death Star candle. Exactly. Yeah. So your your light bulb is uh, has a little way to go before it can blow up a planet. Okay. So uh, the question is, how does a a laser really work? And the point of similarity is this mirrored wall thing. Um. So in a laser, you also have, or at least, yeah, yeah. I think it's fair to say that in in most lasers, uh at least the ones that I know about, <laughs> um, you have some sort of mirrored surfaces which are going to cause light to bounce around in, this, in, a, in a kind of box for, um, for many, many, many times. Mm. But the difference is that the light, while it's bouncing around, is doing something. It's being amplified, and that's where the, the word amplification comes from in the, in the acronym. So there's something inside this, this box which is causing light to uh, to increase in intensity as it bounces around the box. Mm. So you might you you put a little bit of light into this this medium inside the box, and you get a lot of light out. So the question is is how does that work? How how are you going to uh, produce this ap- amplification or gain? That's another word for it, gain. Yeah, that's that sounds like the uh, the money section of our <laughs> of our list. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, that's right, and that's the. The thing that is that is quite difficult to, to do, um, and uh, and you're, you you obviously do a, a lot of stuff to do with music and maybe audio engineering and stuff. So I guess the word gain uh, is familiar to you. We got our rock contexts. and roll. It's it, we got a, our our laser is going to be all rock and roll. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So okay, how does this work? So um, I guess the 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 broad picture would be as follows. And I'll, I'll paint a little bit of a very cartoon sort of picture, and then we can talk about maybe how this cartoon is is not accurate in practice in in its details. Okay, so uh, we have atoms, right? So suppose we have this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not suggesting we go back to, <laughs> to the start of everything, but no. So uh, this is this is closely connected to lasers. Don't worry. So we're going to imagine that inside our box we've got some some sort of gas. Um, and in uh, the, the sort of classic laser has uh, a gas which is formed of helium and neon. And you may not be surprised that neon is, uh, is, is used in this context because uh, if, you, if you pass a, um, an electrical discharge through a neon tube, it, start, it sort of flu- fluoresces. And it looks um, magnificent. It looks really cool. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, and so, yes, and so, so this same property of neon is going to be useful for, uh, for, for lasing as well. So um, you've got some sort of gas and the atoms in this gas have certain uh, allowed energies that they uh, can be in. So specifically what I mean by that is that one of the electrons in the, in the atom that forms up this gas uh, can be sort of close to the nucleus or it can be far away, something like that. And there is an energy associated with those two allowed states. And because this is quantum mechanics, uh, you can't be in any state. You have to be in one of these quantized levels. That's where the, the quantum comes from in quantum mechanics. So what that means is that you can't have any energy or the electron can't have just any energy. It can have uh, one energy, which we'll call E1. And that's where it's like uh, close to the nucleus of the atom. Home base. Exactly, home base. Or it can be a bit further away and we'll call that E2. So a slightly higher energy. Mm. Okay, so good. We've got this this very simple model of an atom where an electron can be in um, a lower energy level or it can be in a higher energy level. And there's an energy difference between those two levels and it can sort of jump up and down between the two. But uh, you may know of the principle of conservation of energy. You can't just have uh, energy for nothing. Right. Um, you've got to get it from somewhere and it's got to go back to somewhere. Damn. And second time <laughs> my laser has been flawed. <laughs> That's right. So uh, are you familiar with where the energy could come from to, to promote that electron to the higher energy level, for example? So my understanding is mm -hmm. that, well, it would be the light itself. Because So now I'm, I'm reaching back to chemistry. So what can happen or what does happen is you shoot your photon at the atom, hits into yep. the electron, the electron jumps up to this other state, this other quantum level, E2, yep. and then it'll hang out there for, I don't know how long, maybe a little <laughs> while. I'm, I'm assuming not long on, on the scale of things. Um, but at, And then when it jumps back down, that's when it spits its uh, the, another photon away. Exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So the energy to promote the electron to a higher level comes from light energy. It comes from light. And when the... Uh, when, when the electron jumps back down to the lower energy level, the energy goes back into back into light, um, and it goes back into light in the form of a single photon. So, a photon being a particle of light mm -hmm. or a sort of little packet of of light energy. But there's a very specific property of the light that's emitted, and specifically, it has to have a, a particular frequency. The reason is that the freq the energy of that photon is related to its frequency. So if I increase the frequency, equivalently if I decrease the wavelength, uh, then I increase the energy. Mm -hmm. So because there's this very specific energy difference between these two levels, that means that there's a very specific energy that needs to be dumped into the photon, right? Right. And so that means there's a very specific wavelength that this photon has. So for example, you can have like, you can have atoms that have transitions, these energy level differences that correspond to green light or red light, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's very famous. That's sort of where quantum mechanics first came from, mm -hmm. these dis the discovery of these. Well, I mean, that's maybe a bit, maybe not entirely true. I think it sort of came <laughs> from the black body radiation spectrum. But anyway, um, this is sort of one of the early discoveries that was um, very important for identifying um, identifying uh, models that eventually led to quantum mechanics were these discrete, these, uh, discrete um, lines uh, or discrete wavelengths that, um, that gases can produce. Right, because so so, I guess the other, the alternative, you know, to put myself in the mind of one of these pre-quantum scientists would be that it would be like a continuous spectrum. You shoot in a certain amount of energy and you'll get, yeah. a, you know, the similar back, but because they were seeing individual... Mm -hmm spectral lines they were like something is something we got a <laughs> mystery scooby-doo <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly um so yes that's right so that's that's sort of this very simplified model of how an atom works and how importantly how an atom interacts with light mm -hmm. so it can if it encounters a photon of a very specific frequency a frequency that corresponds to that that transition in energy levels it might absorb that photon and the electron goes up to that higher higher energy level. Mm -hmm. And then there's no light. 
So uh, that's good. That's that's a process called stimulated absorption. Mm-hmm. And there's that word stimulated is yes. coming in. So um, we've got another process called stimulated emission, right? So that's the the two words from the acronym LASER. And I don't know, any guesses what, as to what that involves? It, do we... So we have an excited electron. Do we mm-hmm. whack a mole it with another <laughs> another uh, photon? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yes, yeah. yes I'm getting it. <laughs> I'm getting it. <laughs> um, perfect. So you you bring another photon along to the party, and you get out two photons in the end. So um, an atom's just sitting there in its excited state, and when a photon with that precise frequency again comes along. Um, so maybe it's green light of a particular wavelength. It comes along, it stimulates the emission of another photon Mm -hmm. uh, from that atom, and then two photons with that same wavelength propagate forward. And that process is really, uh, really special because the resulting two photons have exactly the same direction of travel. They have exactly the same wavelength because Mm -hmm. they correspond to this this transition, the same transition, and they have the same phase so the the peaks of the wave fronts that uh, that make up these two photons um line up so the peaks line up and the troughs line up yeah and so these two waves are sort of moving together <laughs> yeah so yeah because i guess that was going to be what my question was because it's like if if we're conserving energy it i was waiting for the shoe to drop on what the benefit was because it, you know we, I, we can't get more into our yeah. atom that we're getting out when we're shooting our photon into it so but it, so I guess that's that's the thing we want is like if we can get these two out together and they're in the same direction and they're in the same phase that's going to lead to our we, we, that that's the scalable portion <laughs> that and, yeah that's yeah. that's right that's the the thing that makes the laser actually kind of interesting right or uh, it provides it the features that we that we want in a laser yeah exactly so um, but it's it's obviously going to still obey the principle of conservation of energy you're not going to be able to get extra light out it's just that or extra energy out sorry it's just that the energy that you put in comes out in the same in all of the the, in exactly the same form so in photons that have um, a specific frequency and are all in phase so meaning that the waves move together right and so that's actually another difference between the operation of a laser and the operation of your light box Mm -hmm. in the light box the the light bulb is producing photons of not only different um, uh, different wavelengths that you're filtering out, but also different phases. Right. It's completely uh, the the phases are completely random, mm-hmm. and same with the polarization, which is the direction in which the light is the electric field of the light is is oscillating. Right. right. Whereas in a laser, at least in an idealized laser, all of this stuff is exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. I have I have a question. Um, so here's so going back to chemistry real quick. Um, maybe this is something you were going to get to, but so you so far you've mentioned neon and helium, and those are noble gases. And what makes them what makes them so noble is <laughs> they have uh, two. Well, their their shells are filled. Correct. They have. The, yeah. the right the right amount of valence electrons helium has its two and then I guess neon has eight in its outer most um, I think so from memory yeah <laughs> could Me be too. I Me too. could be getting that wrong <laughs> the point is that it's it's stable is what I'm getting at right um, yeah is yeah, that exactly. is that an important component to to getting an excited electron like I guess I guess the question is could you use like any atom any element to make your laser or is it, or is it kind of just like because we have the stable thing it's really easy to dial in like you know it, it doesn't want to change at all so we know exactly the kind of light we got to mm-hmm. hit it with to get it to do all this stuff so i think in principle there's nothing stopping you from making a laser out of any gas i think however there's something very important that we that we need to talk about which is uh which is population inversion. So what we're going to get to is the fact that we need the number of atoms in the excited state to be greater than the number of atoms in the ground state. Okay. So basically, um, the when I say atoms in the excited state, I mean the electrons, uh, you know, one of the outermost electrons of that atom need to be further away from the nucleus, so in a higher energy state. 
And if we get that population inversion, if we have more atoms in the excited state than in the ground state, then we have the possibility to have amplification of light. And that, uh, that population inversion is not necessarily an easy thing to achieve. Um, so we can talk about later what some of the what some of the techniques for achieving that inversion are. Right, right. But um, a quick Google uh, <laughs> um, can give us some more examples of lasers that have uh, gases as their gain media. So gain medium being the sort of technical term for the stuff in that box which is causing amplification. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so some other examples I think are argon. So I, I believe that's also a noble gas, right? Uh, yes. It's my, uh, yeah, inert gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, my periodic table knowledge is <laughs> sorely lacking. Um, but you can also have carbon dioxide gas lasers, carbon monoxide gas lasers, and then you've got some other, oh, nitrogen, I think, and then other, yeah, he heaps of other stuff. Oh, here we go. Um, uh, th there's some mixture of gases which include hydrogen and maybe fluorine. So, okay. All sorts of different examples. Well, um, at least we have an abundance. I, I, so I hear we have an abundance of nitrogen here on on planet Earth. So, and I need to make my <laughs> <that's right. laughs> my galactic. Uh, you know, when I'm trying to take over the solar system, I'll know where I get my uh, my my uh, <laughs> source material. That's true. From. <laughs> that's very true. But the the most common lasers are, for example, laser pointers or lasers in uh, CD players, or maybe not so common anymore. But you know. Um, or lasers in, I don't know, like laser eye surgery, that sort of thing. Um, there are there are many different applications of these things, obviously. And those are not gas lasers. They they are usually semiconductor lasers. So they they have some little some little wafer of semiconductor in there, and that's the material that's causing. That's the gain medium, if okay. you like. Yeah, yeah. That's the material that's causing the amplification. Um, but you've got all sorts of other things. You've got Ruby lasers, you can make a, a laser out of oh, ruby. Yes, yeah, that's pretty yes. cool. <laughs> um, and I think that was one of the first that was discovered, actually. Why, why have a laser if it can't also be beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> that's true, exactly. We're going to make one. <laughs> so, yes, you can make these things out of all sorts of materials. Okay, so where were we? We were talking about... Uh, this, this, so we have, yeah, we have stimulated absorption, so light being absorbed by atoms. We've got stimulated emission, which is light interacting with an atom in an excited state and then producing extra light. Mm. And then we've got something else, which is called spontaneous emission. And maybe you can guess about what, <laughs> what that involves. Well, all right. So atoms themselves mm -hmm. are fickle, are fickle. Full stop. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and sometimes they they do things. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I. so I guess, well, <laughs> all I've said so far is you have your electron, mm -hmm. you can shoot your light at it, it'll get excited, and then it spits something back out. I don't, yeah. so... I don't know. I don't, never heard nothing about no spontaneous emission <laughs> happening with my electrons. Well, as you said, they these atoms are, are fickle. So if you have an atom in an excited state and it's just sitting there, it will, for for some reason, randomly, at an unknown time, spit out a photon and drop down to its ground state. Mm -hmm. And that photon will have the same wavelength as the uh, as associated with the energy transition um, of that atom, but the direction that it travels is going to be completely random. Mm -hmm. So it's this bizarre process um, that's. That's quantum mechanical in origin. I mean, all this stuff is ultimately quantum mechanics. And uh, yeah, and that's the, the sort of third way that light can, if you like, interact with an atom. Mm -hmm. If the atom's in the excited state, then it can just spit out a photon and drop down to its ground state. So, okay, we've got these three ways. Um, so what we are going to do to make a laser is we have our gain medium, which is this stuff in the box. It can be a gas, for example, as, we, as we've said. And we are going to pump the atoms in this gas into the excited state. Um, now, that's a really difficult thing to achieve because if I, if I just shoot some, sh some light into that box with the same wavelength as the transition that we are 
are interested in, this difference between the, the two energy states. Um, well, initially, this, uh, the, this light is going to be absorbed, right? Because if we start off with all of the atoms in the ground state, then when uh, a photon encounters one of these atoms, uh, it's going to be absorbed and that, that electron in the atom is going to jump up to the excited state. But then after a while, half of the atoms are going to be in the ground state and half of them are going to be in the excited state. And so now when a photon comes, uh, comes along and enters this gas and encounters an atom, it's 50% likely to be absorbed because the atom's in the ground state and it's 50% likely to cause spontaneous, uh, to cause, cause stimulated emission, sorry. So if the atom's in the excited state, then the, it's the whack-a-mole thing again. So your photon produces an extra one. So you can't just shoot light at this gas and hope that you're going to get this population inversion. Mm. Um, what we need to do is find some clever way to pump the, uh, pump the atoms into their excited state. And what we would like is that all of the atoms, or at least as many as possible, are pumped into the excited state. And that's quite a tricky thing to do. So that's where all of these um, fancy gain media come from, or at least, you know, why they can act as gain media. Mm -hmm. uh, but a simple thing to have in mind would be, for example, instead of two energy levels, we have three energy levels. And there's a transition associated with the energy difference between the first energy level and the third, right. and then an energy difference between the first energy level and the second. Right. And what we're going to do is we is we shine some light that's resonant, that uh, has the same wavelength that as light that can cause a transition from the ground state to the highest excited state, and then because of uh, the because of the specifics of this electro of the of these atoms they have some properties that mean that they decay very quickly from that uh, top excited state to the middle state okay okay so what we're going to want is some some atoms that uh, decay to that middle state without producing a photon mm -hmm. and the way that that can happen is uh, is sort of depending on the it depends on the the atoms so in the helium neon lasers um, I think what happens is that uh, you excite helium, and then through collisions that causes that causes some loss of energy through you know these billiard ball collision type right. processes, and then some of that energy gets transferred to neon, and it uh, and it causes the electrons in the neon atoms to be in a sort of middle excited state. So it's it's sort of like you, you can't just directly go to the thing we want. Um, it's mm -hmm. kind of like we need to set up this cascade of events that will kind of like it's like setting up dominoes and you hit the right domino and yeah exactly yeah, okay yeah yeah so you you need some sort of as you say some sort of process of events which is going to result in eventually the atoms being in the in the excited state mm -hmm. um and you can you can do that through uh the sort of three level process where you've got some some sort of extra high excited state and some process that gets you from that high excited state to the middle state without producing any photons. So that can be through collisions, or if you've got some solid state system like Ruby, it can be through uh, phonons. So you can emit some uh, particles of sound, right? Some vibrations in the in the lattice. Our our domination is going to have a soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. That's right. Um, so something that is not producing light, but that gets you from uh, a higher level to a middle level. Mm -hmm. And that middle level needs to be sort of more stable than the higher level, because you don't want all of your atoms in the highest level, which is sort of useless to us. We want them in the middle level. Right, right. And we don't want them jumping down into the, uh, into the bottom level from the middle level very quickly. Right. So what we would like is that we pump the atoms to the, to the highest level, then very, very, very quickly, they decay through these processes to the middle level, and then they wait there for a bit. They can stay there for, you know, I don't know, some milliseconds or microseconds. Right, I'm right. not actually sure of the timescales that we're actually talking about here. But, very, you know, in comparison to the first right, jump, right. it's there for, for a long time. And then, after a while, we have the population inversion. Because we've, if there's, a, if there's a, an atom in the ground state then the the pump that we're using which can be light as i said before it, it the the light would need to be able to get an electron from e0 to e2 or like e the the bottom one to the right, the highest right. one so so whenever it whenever that pump light encounters uh, an atom in the ground state 
it pumps it up to the highest excited energy state, but it almost never encounters an atom in that highest excited state because that electron or that atom decays into the middle state right. very quickly. Right. Okay. So that pump light can only encounter basically atoms in the ground state, which they pump up to the to the higher level. Right. Or atoms in the middle state. So amazing. So what we get after a certain period of time is that all of the ground state atoms uh, just sort of disappear. They all just get converted um, at the end of the day into middle state atoms. Mm -hmm. And so we get our population inversion. Yeah. Okay, cool. Does that all make sense so far? Yeah, yes. Um, I think I have the gist of it. Okay, cool. Yeah. I feel like I feel like we're right. We're we're almost at the point where we can push our big red button, and it will <laughs> we'll get That's, these yeah. these middle ground atoms to to shoot off their uh, their bit. We're getting there. Absolutely. I'm just gonna take my jumper off. Sure. Americans, a jumper is a sweatshirt. Okay. Oh, anyway. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> true. Yeah. True. Okay. So yes, as you say, we're almost there. Um, what we need now is for something to set off a cascade. And what would, what would be nice is if, that, uh, if there was a little bit of light that had the right wavelength um, and was traveling in the right direction to produce a cascade of, uh, of transitions causing stimulated emission uh, for all, so, so, uh, so that all of the atoms in that middle excited state jump down to the ground state and release all of these photons at once. But there is such a process that's going to produce this atom, uh, this this photon with the right, uh, with the right direction and the right wavelength, um, eventually, which is spontaneous emission. That's what we were. Uh, that was the third way that light can interact with atoms that I said before. So this is the sort of idea. Once we have this population inversion, we can expect after a little while uh, that spontaneous emission is going to happen, and then some light is going to be produced, and it's going to uh, sort of fly off on a, in a random direction, but if it's oh, if it's if it's oh, can I let me see if this random light goes off in a certain direction, it hits this other nearby atom at just the mm -hmm. right frequency. They're going to be mm -hmm. able to do the whack a mole where they both get lined up and then yep. soldier out. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So the spontaneous emission causes causes all of the others to jump down if it encounters them or or to to go through it a little more step by step so the spontaneous emission causes one photon that then hits a, an atom and that atom re releases another photon while the electron in the atom jumps from the middle state to the ground state and those two photons have the same wavelength then those two photons go on and uh, interact with two other or yeah two other atoms right and do the whack-a-mole thing, and then they yeah. go on to interact with four other atoms and so on. But the thing is, for reasons that we'll get into, this laser or the, the gain medium inside this laser is going to be uh, sort of collimated into this big, yeah, in, in, into one direction, basically. So it's going to be sort of quite thin and, it, and long. So our gas chamber, for example, is going to be thin and long. Right. So some of the spontaneous emission is going to go sort of flying off into directions orthogonal to that to that axis, um, or at least not in the direction of the axis. And other photons are going to be in the direction of the axis and pass through all of the um, all of the the uh, atoms in that in that column of gas. Right. Um, and so if it's passing through all of it, then it's getting a lot of gain. So uh, it's producing a lot of amplification because it's getting all of those extra photons from the atoms in the excited state. So that's the sort of idea of how a laser works in theory. You've got atoms which can be pumped into this excited state and they pumped so that you get this population inversion. So many more atoms in the excited state than in the ground state. And then because of spontaneous emission and stimulated emission, uh, a little bit of light goes into this this gain medium or, or gets produced within this gain medium and gets amplified many, 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 many times right. and produces this big, big beam of light. And because of the properties that we were talking about before of this, uh, of these quantum processes, you have all of that light traveling sort of down the column uh, in, the, in the same direction and with the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that all make sense so far? Yeah. It, it's, it's almost beautifully simple in some regards it's like <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. It is, it is like such a nice story. Yeah. <laughs> it's tidy. It's really yeah, tidy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Canva, how about for right now, we put a pin in this discussion on lasers and perhaps we can come back next week to finish this up. As always, thank you everybody for listening. This has been Question Field and we'll catch you next time. Later. You've been listening to Question Field. Question Field is a game media production and is produced by its hosts, Campbell McLaughlin and Brian Buchanan. For more information, please check us out on Instagram at Question Field Pod, on Twitter at Quest Field Pod, and on TikTok at Question Field. If you have a question you'd like to submit, or would simply like to leave a message, please send us an email at questionfieldpod at gmail.com. Recently, the James Webb Telescope discovered five new stars located in the review section of your favorite podcast app. Thank you for listening.